Hi, I'm John, senior pastor here at the Gender Road Christian Church. We are in the season of Lent, which is a 40-day period leading up to Easter Sunday, Christ's resurrection and victory over sin and death. And so during this Lenten season, I hope you're able to pray or to fast or take on some new spiritual discipline, which helps deepen your relationship with Christ. I encourage you to follow along in your own Bible as you hear God's Word read. Let's get started. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Lessons, the reading. Well, you know what? Today, we do not have the gospel reading on the screen. It's not up there. It's not a mistake either, okay? So if you didn't bring your Bible, I need you to get out your pew Bible, okay? Because we're going to be reading from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Where do we find the Gospel of Matthew, the First Testament or Second Testament? So that would also be called what? New Testament, okay? Matthew is going to be the first Gospel. It's chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. And if you are on page 894 of your pew Bible, you are on the right page, okay? Just in case we're not familiar with the Bible, that's okay. It's on page 894, the gospel reading. So if you brought your own Bible, definitely turn to Gospel of Matthew. If not, we're going to follow along in here. And I'll tell you what, also in the pews, there's pens and pencils. So if there's a part in there that you like, underline it, mark it. That's what Bibles are for. They will print more Bibles if we wear them out, okay? But getting into the Word, reading into the Word is extremely important. And we love being able to put stuff up on the screens, but sometimes we use that as a crutch, don't we? We start reading that, and, and nothing can replace whether electronically or that, that real Bible in your hands, reading that and rereading it and reading that and letting that word continue to speak to you. And so this is Transfiguration Sunday, because okay? Epiphany has now ended. We will be in the season of Lent next Sunday. So this Wednesday is called Ash Wednesday, and we'll have a community service because uh, we're part of the community at Pope John the 23rd, where the imposition of ashes will be offered and uh, so next Sunday will then be our series, six weeks series of Lent, leading up to Easter on April 20th. And so we have this transfiguration, sort of this theophany. And what's a theophany? A theophany is the appearance of a deity, the appearance of God in the Bible, because Jesus is physically transfigured into his um, apocalyptic form or, or, or post-apocalypse body. In other words, he starts to take on that shape, that appearance of what will happen with the second advent or the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we read about that in here. And also, just as a, another little bit of education, when we talk about this transfiguration, this really, it's really more than a transformation of Jesus. It comes, originates from that Greek word, meaning transformation, but it's more than what we might read about in Romans 12, 12, where we talk about the transforming, renewing of our minds, or in 2 Corinthians, when we read about uh, being transformed in, into the image of the glory of God. This is truly the essence of God being set upon, realized, and seen through Jesus Christ's Jesus Christ transfigured body. And so what we have here is what can be considered a, a, a prolepsis or um, an occasion where a future event of what's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes again is we get a brief glimpse of it now. So that's another term that we can look at in terms of the writing style or what this event is, a prolepsis in, of Jesus Christ. And so as we read through here, pay attention because there are terms that are being used that as 
as, as the Hebrew people would have recognized it from the scriptures, that the Gentiles would have started to understand it because they would have been influenced by the different Hellenistic cultures and the philosophies of the time. And what um, we're trying to understand here through the gospel writer is that Jesus Christ is more than anything than what humankind could have conjured or come up with. And so we read this. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain. What did we read in Exodus after six days, right? So start seeing the similarity. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. And so when we see this, like, shone like the sun, it's the grandeur, it's the glory of God that is resting on Jesus Christ. And this dazzling white reflects the majesty of God. It shows one that has been elected by God. This is God. And suddenly, um, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white, and suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because Peter's starting to say, this is the end of times. Elijah has come back. Here's Moses. The, the full manifestation of God is happening here. So I'm going to make a place where you can all dwell. But then something happened. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. This bright cloud, this is what's called in, in, in Hebrew the Shekinah, the glory of God, that same cloud that overcame Mount Sinai, overcomes them in this voice says, this is my son, the beloved, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Reverend Dr. Judah Jones states that the transfiguration marks the midpoint in a series of scenes that define who Jesus is. At both, both his baptism and his transfiguration, this heavenly voice announces that this is God's son. And at his temptation in Gethsemane and Gethsemane and at his crucifixion, Jesus wrestles with the humiliation and suffering and abandonment that he as the son of God must endure. And finally, the resurrected Jesus claims his identity, sending his disciples out to teach and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus comes to them and says, do not be afraid. Get up. Rise up. It's the same term used when the angel describes at the tomb that Jesus Christ has been raised, that Jesus Christ has been resurrected. In other words, Jesus is saying to those disciples who have fell down in fear, get up. Fear not. Get up, fear not. So the cloud overshadows them. And we see this voice of God that we see echoing in the baptism where God said, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. And the voice adds the command then here in Matthew versus in the other synoptic gospels that talk about this in Mark and Luke, both in, in chapter nines of those gospel here, Matthew adds, listen to him. And then what do the disciples do? It's at the sound of God, the voice of God, that they fall down afraid and terror, don't they? They're watching all this happen. And Peter starts talking, and then this glory of God becomes so magnificent, and the voice calls out that then they fall down. Listen to him. Listen to him. And so the scene does provide allusions to Elijah's encounter with God on the mountain, Moses on Mount Sinai, and the glory of God that overshadows both the mountain and the tent where Moses met God. But let's go back to verse 7. Get up. Do not be afraid. Don't we hear do not be afraid a lot when we see people encounter God in the Old Testament when the angels greet the shepherds? When the angel greets Mary, always do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. So there is something that happens when we encounter that God with us, in front of us, speaking directly to us. Do not be afraid. And so there's a voice affirms who Jesus Christ is. 
And then we're told to listen, to follow the commands of Jesus, to be obedient to the teachings of Jesus. But then Jesus raises out. You know, we can talk about all this academic stuff, talk about all what it means and how it alludes to the Old Testament, fancy words like prolepsis and theophany and all that stuff, right? But how's it gonna impact how you live your life now? You know, last night when we were watching the Mish play, there was, you know, concern about what is this gonna do? What's this gonna, you know, bring up with people when you bring such real life tough issues in front of our youth? And some of the youth that haven't even met, you know, dealt with some of that stuff, but they're certainly around it in their schools. What's going on? And there were people that made the decision, other clergy in our community, not to go. And my point was, it's happening out there. And this show's coming to town, and we need to be there. We need to get up, rise up, and go out and let God bring the growth, let God be there and guide us. Because somebody out there's hurting, somebody out there's being abused, someone else is doing the drugs, someone else is considering suicide, someone else is considering all of these issues, and whatever it may be, and whether we agree 100% with the theology, because the truth is, there won't be anyone here where we agree 100% on theology, on what we believe in Jesus Christ. There's not even 100% agreement between you and your partner, you and your spouse. If you truly start going through it, you will not agree 100% on everything about God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, baptism, life after death, all of that. But somehow we get wrapped up in this belief that there is. I received an email recently from someone saying, I'm considering coming to your church, but I believe there must be 100% unity in what's believed. I said, well, I don't think you're going to find that. And he started asking me all these questions, and I said, you know what, that's, that's too much to lay out in an email. Why don't you give me a call? I haven't heard from him. Because how, how does God reach out to all of us? Because Jesus Christ, and what's so freeing in this, is when the disciples fall down in terror, they don't know what to do. Even when something magnificent and great is happening in front of them, what, do this, what is the human response? To be afraid, to become paralyzed, to fall down, to not even look up, sometimes pr pretend it's not happening, right? But Jesus here, and what's, because you know, when we come into Lent, we're gonna have all kinds of time to deal with your sin, my sin, you repenting, me repenting, right? The sacrifice, um, fasting, all of that. But let's focus on something that is so freeing right now. Jesus Christ comes over and says, rise up. This is a brief resurrection story for the disciples. It's a resurrection story for us because Jesus Christ was resurrected through God's power and Jesus Christ who is explaining the glory of God is saying you are resurrected in what you can do. Get up, rise up, do not be afraid. And then they go down this mountain and Jesus starts to heal people and removes a child possessed by a demon. But everything's not okay. At the end of the Mish play last night, they were profiling some of the main characters, you know, kind of like, you know, what happened to them after they graduated high school. And for some of the, the, the students that graduated, you know, good things happened. And for some they didn't, they got killed or died of cancer. And it was like, whoa, what? You know, don't we want this happy ending? Don't we want our lives to have happy endings? Don't we want our lives to go perfect? And I said kind of funny, sarcastically, whatever, to my wife. I'm like, because, you know, they, they, they went through about 12 people. And um, the first couple were good, happy endings. And then, you know, this person hits somebody while texting and kills them. And then this one's, you know, has something good happen in their life and then gets killed by a drunk driver. I mean, and then... Then there was this couple that started learning how to fly, and I'm like, what, are they going to die in a plane crash? You know? And then so they didn't, and I looked over my wife, and I'm like, well, at least they didn't die. And my wife said something very profound. She said, you know, that's real life, though. That is real life. Because bad things happen to us, and then we're resurrected, and things go well, where life's going good, and then boom, the bottom falls out. Doesn't it? Time and time again. But Jesus Christ comes to us, and in this message, it's saying, do not be afraid. 
rise up. Do not be afraid, rise up. Even in what we're trying to do in this church, it doesn't always go so well. We had three singers lined up for today, and boom, one, two, three, they all get sick, and what do we do? Rise up. And someone answered that call. Did she cure world cancer today? No, she didn't. But was she able to lead us and help us worship God? The whole praise team did, and that's where things happen and you have to trust because God provides the growth and people come in and they serve in different ministries and you're going to be called to not be afraid and rise up. And maybe that's what you do simply by being courageous in the school. When someone else is picking on a kid, say, hey, dude, you know, lighten up, right? My third and fourth grade boys, that's what we talk about because they see other kids get picked on and bullied already at that young age. And I'm like, what do we do? What do we say? How do we respond to that? Man, that's rising up and not being afraid. That's what you do at work. I mean, how many of you deal with workplace bullies, right? I mean, people that just are so out of touch, they just take it all out on you. How do you rise up and not be afraid? How do you rise up and start making a change in your life? Because God does say, listen to him. Listen to these teachings of Jesus. Listen. And one of the points they made in this play last night that we've covered here, but I like how they make it very direct, is don't just go to church. Don't just go to church. What happens at church should start to affect your life, and it affects how you live your life. In Matthew 7, 24, it talks about that when, if we hear without obeying, that our life becomes empty. 20, verse 24 says, everyone who hears the words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. What happens to the other people who didn't build their house upon the rock, upon the foundation of Jesus Christ? The storms came and what? Boom, gone. And today we're going to rise up because Jesus Christ is saying to you and whatever crap you're dealing with, okay, rise up. Do not be afraid because we're dealing with it. All of us are. All of us are. I know it. Okay? Spring's coming though. Spring's coming. Okay? Hang on and trust in Jesus. You know what some of my prayers are sometimes? Lord, I don't get it. I don't know. I'm done with it. It's yours whatever. I get so mad, I get so worked up, and then I just got to step back, right? We all deal with that. When are you going to be ready to say, Lord, it's yours? And it's not just some trite thing, oh, give, your, give it all to God, okay? I'm not taking that off your little Christian plaque you hang on the wall. This is real life that when you just keep getting all confused and paralyzed and not know what to do, that you trust God and you listen for Jesus Christ saying, get up, rise up, Your resurrection's here. Do not be afraid. Amen. I hope the message you've heard today has been a blessing to you, and I know God's Holy Spirit will continue to to work with you on that message as you understand God's will for your life. If you have questions, give me a call. Contact us here at the Gender Road Christian Church, and may God's blessing be with you during this period of Lent.